Well, here's a few news articles. So the Republican National Committee is suing Google for returning to something they've said many times. They feel like they're being discriminated against on the Internet. Um, they have a big, big complaining for years that Facebook and Twitter remove their stuff, which is um, certainly not true of Facebook. Um, Right-wing stuff is always the top eight of, eight of the top ten um, posts on Facebook because they pay a lot to make it that way. But anyway, now they're claiming that Google is blocking their, their fundraising emails. And Google's def defense, of course, is that their anti-spam solution is crowdsourced. So the reason stuff appears in spam is because many users marked it as spam. Um, but anyway, they'll go to court and see what they can do about that. And the pressure is uh, very big on all internet companies to filter content much more strictly now. And so that's why they're all doing ruthless things to appear to do something about the, all the bad content, because both the right and the left are mad at them. Uh, all right, so let's see. In this Scientific American one, I was surprised about this. There's a standard model of particle physics, which has been all my life they've known this. Um, the simple model, which I think they got a picture of there, is that's the standard model. There's quarks and leptons. There's three layers of each one that are identical except for their mass and uh, then only five bosons, and that's the standard model. And it turns out that there are a series of experiments, like five or six of them so far, that reveal that there's something else going on. There are extra particles created. They don't know what they are. And this is a good thing because one of the many problems with the standard model, there's a lot of problems, the simplest one being it cannot explain why there is more matter than antimatter in the universe. Uh, that's a huge one. Feynman's thesis was about that. And, and um, the, another huge problem is that 80 to 90 percent of the entire mass of the universe is invisible dark matter. And they have no idea what it is. There are some ideas, but nothing been proven at all. So they know there must be something else out there, some, something missing from this model. And we're getting to see a few interesting experiments to, to give you some clue how to measure things to find out what it would be. And let me, uh, there, I see. All right, I see questions. Okay, good. Anyway, all right, I, I see some people with questions. Uh, all right, uh, people ask when my in-person office hours are. You wanna meet me, just come to any of my classes. I'm in Science 200 from six till eight or nine, Monday through Thursday. Uh, so come to this class if you wanna meet me in person. And um, oh, someone said the, uh, the class helped with reverse engineering at NCL. Well, I would hope so, good. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, this, uh, this class in particular is pretty closely related to reverse engineering, also the exploit development. Anyway, this one here was pretty interesting, although kind of hard to understand. But basically the point is this is what Einstein wrote about in the einstein pedalsky rosen experiment. When they uh, came out with quantum mechanics, they have this concept of entanglement. If you have a single particle that decays into a particle and an antiparticle, then they move in opposite directions. On the original particle, if you are in a reference frame where it's at rest, the total momentum is zero. So when it decays, the total momentum will still be zero. You have two particles going at opposite directions at the same speed. And if there's a zero spin, and the particles that decays into have spin, then one must have spin up and the other must have spin down to make the spin add up to zero, because everything is conserved. The problem is you do not know which one is spin up and you do not know which one is spin down, and those are quantum mechanically indeterminate states until you measure one. But you let them travel some large distance, like the distance from the Earth to the Moon, then you measure one of them, and whatever you find it to be, if you find it to be spin up, you now immediately know the other one is spin down, because the total has to add up to zero. And that means in that instant, somehow the measurement you make in one location must have spooky action at a distance changing the reality in the other location. And that really bothered Einstein. He said, that doesn't make any sense. How do you have this spooky interaction between uh, space-like separations, is what he would call them in his general relativity, two things that are far apart. And uh, it suggests that some kind of signal moves faster than the speed of light between them. Or, and anyway, uh, people have tested this in many related experiments, and they've determined that the universe is not locally real. In the time of Einstein, they talked about this. Um, the idea of quantum mechanics is everything is an indeterminate state until you measure it. Then it settles down. And he says, do you really think the moon is not there when you're not looking? And ultimately, that is the truth. Ultimately, points that appear to be distant from each other are in fact connected in reality, 
and our concept of this Euclidean three-dimensional space is just a rough approximation, and it's not the way the world really works. And that's what I mean. I say the universe is not locally real. Uh, reality is not determinate the way we think it is. And that's, uh, it's increasingly proven that this is not just some kind of a mistake in the mathematics or quantum mechanics. It's the way the world really works. Yeah, it is kind of awesome. Of course, I don't know what you do about it, but the point is uh, um, it, it does, you know, Einstein's whole thing was based on the concept of causality. And this suggests that uh, you have to rethink these fundamental concepts. Um, Euclidean, the Newtonian and Euclidean models assume that things have a location and they move down a path, and it's not that simple. They approximately have a location, but in detail, they don't really have a definite location, not at all times. All right, so there's this thing going on, been around for a while. You can download files from the internet, and they get a, marked with a mark of the web. Yeah, this is the mark of the web. And there are trick ways to trick Windows into not noticing the mark of the web. Now, one was supposed to be, if you download a zip file and unzip it, the things inside there won't be marked. And when I tried that, it didn't work. But anyway, there are various ways to download something, and it will not have this zone identifier indicating it coming from the internet zone. So uh, I don't think this was a terribly strong security measure anyway, but in fact, it's kind of defective and easily to bypass. Now this nature, yeah, this one, boy, this has happened three or four times in my career that a whole field of science has been going in the wrong direction because of fraud, and it's happened again. 17 retractions from this one guy, geneticist Greg Samesa. His, um, there's a whole bunch of amateur people doing this. They take published scientific papers and they run the photographs through the papers through digital analysis to see if the photographs are just copied, modified, relabeled photographs from other papers, and a lot of them are. And so sometimes that's just sloppiness, sometimes it's intentional, but a considerable amount of time it is deliberate fraud. They've just faked the data, and um, the whole field of Alzheimer's research was sent off in the wrong direction for 20 years by fake data. An enormous amount of cancer research in the 80s and 90s was sent off in the wrong direction by completely fake data, and apparently now genetic research too. So it's, uh, it is not common, however, for a Nobel Prize winner to be faking the data like this, but apparently he's doing it. Of course, he probably didn't do it personally. The thing about Nobel Prize winners is they become like uh, CEOs. Now a full fleet of all junior scientists work under them, and typically they're too busy to monitor what they do, and one of those junior scientists will start faking things, and then uh, now you've got a huge problem. And so apparently they're retracting the papers. The problem is even if you retract the papers, there's already going to be a dozen other papers and PhDs based on those papers. The whole field will be deflected in the wrong direction, usually. I don't know the specifics of this case, but that's what happened in three big cases I know of. Four big cases I know of, actually. Although two of them, I think, were honest mistakes, but the other two were just fraud. But in any case, they had a paper that seemed really exciting and important, but it was wrong. And generations of scientists after it based their work on that stuff, and it took decades before people figured it out. That all of them were just spinning their wheels. And so Adidas. Adidas, I didn't realize how closely Adidas was tied to um, Kanye West. But if you people buy these things, you might know more than me. Apparently 10 or 15 percent of all of Adidas' product lines is name brand Kanye West marked merchandise. And that's why he boldly said a few days ago, they'll never cancel me no matter what I say. They can't possibly live without me. But his out, his sane out, outright Nazism, anti-Semitism has become so terrible that Adidas did terminate him, and this is going to hurt them badly. They're going to have to abandon 50% of their product line. They're going to stop manufacturing products that are popular and selling well and terminate their relationship with him. It's going to cost them a lot of money. And, you know, I'm, uh, I certainly approve of this move, but from a business point of view, I would have considered what is the possibility that Trump will win the next election and America will just be completely accepting of anti-Semitism and Nazism and you can continue to sell these things to the modern new America where this is now considered a good thing. Um, you know, it's uh, especially right before an election, it would seem like uh, perhaps time to just delay this and see which way the wind blows unless you actually care about being Nazis and I don't think they do. I mean, the founder was an open Nazi. I mean, I think Maybe they are now actually trying to abandon their Nazi past, but uh, from a purely business point of view, it might be more productive to embrace your Nazi past the way America's going, but we'll see. Anyway, they didn't go that way. Like everybody else 
They've terminated all relationship with Kanye West, which is very strange considering that Donald Trump is saying things that are almost as bad, and many other Republicans are saying things that are almost as bad, and they're not getting kicked out of the party or punished. It is uh, not clear to me how Kanye is worse than the rest of them, but all of them are trying to distance themselves. Well, all the uninvolved parties are. I haven't heard any Republicans say anything bad about Kanye West. They're still happy enough to embrace him, I think. Anyway, um, so this is, seems like a very fair statement that the biggest cybersecurity risk is complacency. Most of the cybersecurity problems are caused by companies just not doing what they should be doing, not securing their cloud assets, not changing default passwords, not putting on updates, you know. Most of them come from problems they know about that they don't fix, which is true of pretty much all the problems in life. People get sick largely because they eat too much, they smoke, they don't exercise, you know. Most of the problems are in fact caused by people not doing what they should be doing. Not really a surprise coming out of nowhere clobbering them. That happens, but it's not the most common thing. Anyway. Let me stop this.